Uh, hello, welcome to SUNY History Does Week 8, talking about the mid-1950s, uh, some of the music of Miles Davis, uh, quoting some from the great uh, primer uh, Jazz 101, John Swed, S-Z-W-E-D, a complete guide to learning and loving jazz. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> so Swed uh, comments on, and uh, I've included on our, our Jazz History Jazz Week 8 playlist, Three pieces of Miles. Nothing from Kind of Blue, the most recognizable jazz recording, uh, period. Um, and yet the first of the three from the ensemble that mostly in mostly ended up on Kind of Blue. There's there's a couple parts, but essentially his from his class the, the the choice that Swed makes and it makes sense. Uh, the choices he makes for this mid fifties Miles playlist. Uh, represent three innovations of Miles. Uh, his great 50s quintet, uh, the music that he recorded for film, and the music that he recorded in large ensemble with Gil Evans, that was some extension of uh, the Birth of the Cool sessions from uh, the late 1940s, early 1950s. So first we'll talk about Miles Davis's cooking. This is a bit from Swed's text. Uh, the first great Miles Davis quintet in 1956 with John uh, Coltrane, Red Garland, Philly Joe Jones, and Paul Chambers. Okay, so this is Miles' first great 50s, the first great quintet. The second one comes next week in the 60s. Um, a group whose every record is worthy of attention since each draws from this exceptional group's nightly club repertoire. Uh, repertoire excuse me. The record Cookin' opens with My Funny Valentine, uh, just as Davis often opened with it on gigs during this period, demanding quiet and respect. This record gets a slight edge over others of this series through its balance of ballads, blues, and hard bop war horses. Coltrane, at this point, John Coltrane, lacked the consistency and otherworldly inspiration of his later work, i.e. from about 1959 on. Again, careful of our hard and fast demarcations, but let's leave it there for now. But here he plays with a force and sometimes even a recklessness that contrasts nicely with Davis's quiet ruminations. Davis is inspired and witty, and Coltrane matches him all the way. Meanwhile, one of the great rhythm sections follows them at every step, helping to create a unity among equals, almost unprecedented in jazz before this group. Okay, so that's why the entire recording of Cookin', and in fact, everything by the 50s quintet, this is why this music is so important. Uh, there is a unity in the ensemble. As it says, perhaps, you know, unprecedented in jazz before this group or not. I mean, that's a, that's a semantic discussion, I know, but there is something next level about this quintet. And it has to do, in part, in part has to do, you know, Swed points quite accurately to the fact that John Coltrane's solo statements and his sort of musical being uh, crystallize further later than this recording. But there's a tension that comes from Coltrane's searching for... Um, for his soloistic voice uh, in, in every solo, um, for his, him searching for his ensemble voice in the context of uh, how to fit into the ensemble of Miles Davis and then later in the 1950s, the ensemble of Thelonious Monk, right? This kind of, it's not apprenticing. He'd apprenticed already. He was a top flight professional tenor saxophonist, of course, but there's still something being worked out that's set against Miles's, where Miles was in his career at this point it creates, again, this kind of, ye not accidental unity, because it was Miles' genius to put together just the perfect ensembles, always, across all these eras, but drawing from the tension, not even personal tension necessarily, although that existed, but from the musical tension that built as Coltrane and Miles alternated their solo statements, as they played ensembles together, and then fueled by... Uh, the rock solidness of Paul Chambers and Philly Joe Jones, fueled by the creativity of whichever pianist first read Garland, later Wynton Kelly, Bill Evans, of this 1950s quintet, was again state of the art. Um, something about that Swed points to on Cookin' that's also interesting, worthy of note. He says it's his favorite. There, there are several, Steeman, Workin', Cookin', a series of these classic Miles Davis quintet records from the 60s. He likes it best because of the balance of ballads, blues, and hard bop war horses. Okay, so what are we saying? What is he saying? This, the recordings on the, on, uh, the, the tracks on the recording. There are a few of each thing. Remember, we've talked about different forms, the 32-bar song form, often in the form, uh, w whether in the form of a ballad, a mid-tempo stroller, or an up-tempo burner. Uh, there's a few of those uh, of, of, of slow 32-bar ballads, real lyrical, uh, not rhythmically uh, insistent and urgent, rather uh, 
ultra melodic and uh, luxurious, right? Then the blues, you know, as any proper jazz ensemble still did in the 1950s. If you're a jazz band, you're playing the blues as well as other forms, right, in, in your repertoire. And then hard bop, war horses, as in not compositions of Miles per se or his bandmates, which for instance came later in the 60s, but, you know, kind of standard, stand, hard bop standards of the day. Uh, songs like... Uh, Either either drawn from uh, from Tim Pan Alley, like in the case of My Funny Valentine, or uh, other or ja or jazz standards, popular standards or jazz ones. The, the the standard repertoires of the time, no one played it better than the Miles Davis Quintet, and that extended through the 1960s. In fact, in his second great quintet as well. Um, so, uh, mm, describing Davis as inspired and witty, where do we find Miles Davis's point? Uh, uh, excuse me, voice at this point as this quintet coalesces. We've heard him last week struggling to keep up with Parker. We've heard the beginning of his innovations as a band leader and uh, delegator of um, uh, uh, roles, working with Gil Evans, working with uh, The Birth of the Cool, uh, sessions with the sort of large ensemble of musicians, being the soloist voice, playing to, if not his limitations, at least finding his voice through incorporating silence into his playing more profoundly than anybody had before, although analogous perhaps to Thelonious Monk. Uh, well, Basie also did profoundly too, or Ellington in their sort of spare soloistic pian piano accompaniment to their large ensembles, but I mean more as a soloist, right? Miles left a ton of space. He, you know, we talked about, I talked about the other video, Sonny Rollins tinkering with uh, melodic kernels back and forth, as well as the harmonic um, many noted uh, up and down sort of solo lines that he explored. Miles still played lines, but he left a lot of silence. He explored timbre and texture in the notes that he played. He uh, incorporated that human vocal quality that, say, we talk about with Armstrong on the trumpet also, but in a completely different way, in a more muted way, in a more careful way, in a and not in, therefore in a cool and detached uh, big spider back stylist kind of way perhaps you know it's if, if it, one thing if what i'm saying is reminiscent of earlier figures but the fact of the matter is even as miles was playing less and uh showing vulnerability in in on stage while posturing as ultra cool and unaffected as as cool as masking cool always right it was his total approach that was so revolutionary and continued to innovate over decades. We see him changing his musical persona here in the 50s, first with this quintet and then with other pieces. So the second one, I'll talk about that. Uh, Miles's L'Ascenseur pour l'Echafaut, uh, the name of a film uh, that he, uh, Louis, Louis Malle, 1957 film that he that he uh, made music for. I hesitate to say scored because he improvised as well as composed, right? But in fact, he provided the score and as well as others, right? But it was central to it. Uh, Swed writes, it was music that would, quote, come to make us think that every film noir had, film noir as in hard-boiled detective uh, thrillers of the 1950s, 40s, and 50s, uh, had always sounded that way. Slow, walking bass lines, muted, slithering horn lines, miming the characters on the screen and underscoring their emotions. The melodies are brief fragments, sometimes surfacing only for a few moments and then disappearing. This is Miles with European musicians he hadn't worked with before, playing in the moment, improvising musical impressions as he watched the screen. You'll see this when you watch the video uh, in, on our Week 8 playlist. Uh, Ascensor pour le chauffeur. What he played managed to capture the era, era of post-war everywhere, while offering him the freedom to test his compositional skills within a minimalist context. How many other beboppers who worked in the shadow of Charlie Parker could have recorded these little gems of quiet passion? Well, the answer is absolutely nobody. Other people could have done interesting things, but Miles' individual voice comes through so unmistakably. And again, it's not just, when I say his voice, I don't just mean the way he plays the trumpet. Uh, slow walking bass lines, muted slithering horn lines, sure, but a sense of mute, the mute button being sort of half held down throughout the entire session, even when it gets loud, paradoxically, right? Um, miming the characters on the screen, underscoring their emotions. Underscoring is this idea of like supporting, right? Not being out front, but supporting. In fact, that's the way Miles led a band, or that's the way he ran a recording session. That's the way he played for a film, or that's the way he took a solo. Underscoring, supporting, quiet passion, as Sweat asked at the end. Who else could 
bring the quiet passion that he had? And the answer is nobody. Um, in, even in this case, he's working with European musicians he never met. Here's this spontaneous moment for him to say, what can I contribute for him to contribute without saying anything, actually, for him to simply start playing when the, the, when the tape starts rolling with people he didn't know, right? What happened spontaneously? Offering him the freedom to test his compositional skills within a minimalist context. Okay, so even if he played with maximalists, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter later, Tony Williams, I mean everybody, you know, nobody was a minimalist like Miles. And yet, the, so, so a lot of the genius of his uh, legacy has to do with the bands that he created, the recording situations he found himself in, the people he collaborated with. We see him in that sense as a, a worthy um, uh, uh, successor and then also kind of a co-champion of your ensemble is your band, just like Duke Ellington always felt and always said explicitly. Okay, so here's Miles in the 50s, part two, right? Part one was the quintet as it, uh, uh, evidence, for instance, on, um, uh, on, on the record cooking, on the, the, um, the standard My Funny Valentine. Part two is the way he accompanies Louis Miles' film score. Part three, again, kind of drawing further from his experiences in the Birth of the Cool sessions, his collaborations with Gil Evans is, uh, in this case, from the recording Sketches of Spain. Uh, Swed writes, in the late 1950s, Gil, Gil Evans and Miles Davis collaborated on a number of projects that continued directions first started uh, with not just Davis's Birth of the Cool Sessions, also the Claude Thil Thornhill Orchestra that Evans had arranged for. The early morning feel of the frontline harmonizations, the opalescence of the shifting registers and voicings behind the soloists, the shadow plays of riffs. All right, so let's look at each of those. The early morning feel of the frontline harmonizations, as in there was a bright quality to the orchestration, to the notes, uh, to the orchestration and the arranging, both to the instruments chosen and to the notes given to them. That at the way Gil Evans arranged the different instruments that supported the soloist, right, had this kind of brightness and uh, a, a, had a kind of a bounce to it, even if not a rhythmic thrust, a kind of a lightness and a, an airiness, right? Uh, the opalescence of the shifting re registers, okay, sort of a, uh, you know, $20 word or whatever to basically kind of hint at um, the way that Gil Evans, the arranger, deployed register high, medium, low across the ensemble, often unusually having, uh, like Ellington and Billy Strayhorn, as we, as we talked about, having the orchestra, an orchestra because we're talking about strings as well as uh, woodwind, you know, orchestral woodwinds, oboe, flute, bassoon, uh, clarinet, uh, brass that isn't commonly wasn't found in a jazz ensemble that commonly, i.e., the French horn, the tuba, right? These instrumental voices deployed in sometimes um, idiomatic ways and sometimes unusual ways. Tuba playing high register information, uh, flute playing at the bottom of its register, etc. That opalescence, that shimmeringness that comes from those unique uh, and, and, and unpredictable uh, combinations of voices, right? Um, the, shadow play, the shadow plays of riffs. So he's referencing shadow plays of, say, for instance, Indonesia or uh, other Asian cultures primarily, uh, in which when you look at the play on the screen as an audience member, you're seeing the shadow of a puppet uh, projected. So there's a screen, and then behind the screen, there's, the puppet is being held up by a puppeteer, but then you're seeing it in front, and it's just the sh it's being backlit, so you're just seeing the shadow of the puppet, right? What does that evoke uh, metaphorically, what Swed's saying? He's saying that the riffs, the riffs, the little, remember we talked about riffs in Count Basie's big band, right? Chugging along the All-American Rhythm section, supported by these little melodic repeating um, bits. They're short. Riffs are short, usually, and they repeat, and they're rhythmically vital, usually. Those riffs seem like shadow plays here because, think about talking about something being backlit and you see the shadow of it, it's like, again, a muted version of that. The riffs are not like, bop, bop, ba da bop, you know, a rhythmically like shout chorus type of feeling. It's sort of the opposite. They're there, they're back, they're supporting. It's almost like the, 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 the reverse of what you expect from a riff to be doing. With all those things in mind, this is the context that we hear Miles Davis and others, Miles Davis most iconically soloing on sketches. He is the soloist on sketches of Spain, set against this orchestra. Uh, 
Sweat says, Evan seems to test each chord for density. Gil Evans, the arranger, right? Like this is not thick music, right? It is for moments, but it thins out. It's it's uh, creating tension by using instruments in startling ways. Again, we talk about that in Ellington. Uh, placing motion and energy in the harmonics rather than the rhythm. The motion, the energy, the vitality, the, the way forward from start to finish is pushed on not by rhythmic, Again, by, by, by rhythmic thunder, but by uh, harmonics with an S. He's literally referring to the sonic result of many notes at a time being sounded in this kind of you know architectural way uh, and the intensity that can come from that, that can come from harmonic form and individuality. Uh, Sweat writes, Sketches of Spain... And there are other projects of this era, too, these large ensemble collaborations with Miles as a soloist, including Miles Ahead, Porgy and Bess. Um, our suites held together not so much thematically as by shared voices and implied moods. So what is a suite? Well, for starters, a suite, S-U-I-T-E, not a sweet candy, a suite, right, um, is not only a 32-bar song form or a 12-bar form. It's not a cyclical form. So what were these? These were, again, Western classical inspired grand architecture through composed over 40 minutes or whatever the length of an entire piece was. Suites of several things connected to each other. Not just the same thing going over and over and over and over and over. 32 bars, the same, the same, the same. Now it's your turn to solo, my turn to solo, but we're always soloing over the same thing. No. These were ambitious compositional statements with a soloist having constantly different textures to improvise over or with. Okay? Uh, he makes a good point too. Sweat says, Sketches of Spain is music very much of its time, evocative, romantic, and deeply felt, but also at its weakest moments a bit obvious and occasionally over the top, as in there's some schlock in here. What is schlock? Schlock is essentially um, uh, fluff. Um, uh, sometimes slightly saccharine, overly sweet things. And I don't mean S-U-I-T-E, I mean S-W-E-E-T. So lyrical that it's a little much, it's a little on the nose. Sometimes in the 1950s, and indeed ever since the big bands turned into a codified form, uh, and probably when it was too, well, there's always been, a, a, a you know, just like we talked about in the 1950s, the beginning of the first video, the, uh, the, the beginning of, this, of the middle of the 50s, sorry. Um, in relation to Sonny Rollins' Blue 7 and soloists before him, uh, needing to get past the way, what they were soloing with, right? These little phrases of uh, quoting other tunes, being a bit campy and a bit, you know, um, sort of like light light about the whole thing. Uh, sometimes Sketches of Spain is not that it's light sometimes, although I guess that happens, but it actually can feel a bit heavy-handed at times, sort of the opposite of... Um, Ooh, that, ooh, that, I, did you catch that, catch that reference to that other pop tune? No. There'll, there'll be these real, real lyrical, lush string passages or uh, woodwind textures or something that are s almost dripping, are syrupy, literally. That is not the jazz of, you know, lightning fast bebop tunes of Charlie Parker and whatever, although, of course, Parker famously recorded with strings and everybody could go everywhere. But all that is to say on Sketches of Spain, we should think about what Miles is soloing with, okay? Uh, his playing throughout, Sweat says, is remarkable, bringing new colors and emotions into jazz. Well, does that mean he had a palette and oh, I'd like a little red and a little blue and a little this and that? Metaphorically speaking, yes. And it means more, uh, in a, to, say, to put it in a more nuanced way, the way Miles soloed in this painterly way wasn't just to say, here's a little blue, here's a little red, here's some blue, and with a little red in it, what happens to the blue? It turns a little purple. And from that purple, if I put a little brown in, it kind of tilts in that direction. Things become blurry, right? Things have, are, in jazz, things are, frankly, have all, you know, I keep talking about how things don't move chronologically. The fact of the matter is, uh, for Miles Davis, in the three examples on uh, our YouTube History of Jazz Week 8 playlist, whether it's his classic quintet of the 50s, his first classic quintet, his uh, accompanying of film scores, or not so differently, but in, a, in, in its relation to both Gil Evans and earlier explorations, his large ensemble soloing, um, not express, express, explicitly prog programmatic along with a film, but still as though, as though he's recounting a film with his horn, those voices of Miles are various innovations that he uh, made in, in this very fertile 1955 to 1960 period. 
that would point to, you know, and, and, then, and then to wonder, wow, after all that innovation, here he'd come up in bebop, and here he was constantly changing uh, the face of jazz, essentially, and, and, and jazz and its relationship to both popular and classical forms in the 1950s. Wow, where could it possibly go from there? Who needs to do more than that? The fact of the matter is, as we'll see next week, Miles went much further into the 1960s uh, and into the 1970s and 1980s. Again, in the great tradition, say, of Ellington, um, of Armstrong in some ways, although even more innovative. No one innovated more than Miles Davis. He changed his persona. He changed his the, the colors on his palette and the resultant hues that he made from them. Uh, in, indeed, with every project, quite quite explicitly between, say, his 1950s work in quintet, his uh, collaborations for film scores, his collaborations with Gil Evans as a featured soloist. Uh, enjoy Miles Davis's mid-1950s work. <laughs>